In this lecture, I will introduce you to the science of psychology. We will discuss why psychology is so interesting as a topic and as a major. We will also examine some of the major ideas that form the foundation of psychological science. So why do we study psychology? Think about your own reasons for taking this class. You must be interested in the topic, but why? What specific questions do you have that you hope to have answered in this course? Are you intrigued or puzzled by the behaviors of other people? Are you interested in uncovering the reasons for your own behaviors? Do you want to help others to deal with mental illness? There are many motivations for studying psychology. Psychology is one of the most popular majors at most colleges and universities. This is true of the University of Oregon as well. One reason for this is that it is highly relevant and meaningful to everyone. As human beings, we're all interested in behaviors, thoughts, and beliefs of other people. It can also help us to come to understand ourselves. Understanding psychology is useful in many professions outside of psychology. It also helps us to be better thinkers. We learn to be more critical thinkers, looking for logical errors, weighing evidence, and looking for alternate explanations. So what is psychological science? At its simplest, it is the study of the mind, brain, and behavior. Well, what are these components? The brain is pretty straightforward. It's the three-pound meatloaf in our heads. It's also an amazingly complex organ packed densely with neurons. You'll cover the brain and nervous system in great detail in Psych 201, the brain and behavior. So what is the mind? The mind is what the brain does. It's the mental activity that is the product of the brain's electrical and chemical processes. This activity includes things such as thinking, feeling, memory, sight, taste, hearing, and smell. What about behavior? Well, that's pretty straightforward. Behavior is the observable actions that we engage in. All human beings are interested in the questions that psychologists study. And in fact, we're all intuitive psychologists who engage in observation of behaviors and trying to understand those behaviors. However, how does what we do as intuitive psychologists, be it common sense or intuition, differ from psychological science? Well, think about some of the common sense captured in the following idioms. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. What this saying is telling us is that when we're in a relationship with someone, them being away from us might actually increase our liking for them. This seems like it could be possible. However, we also have the idiom, out of sight, out of mind, which makes the opposite prediction, that when somebody's gone, we might forget them, and our attraction to them might decrease. Which one is correct? Well, that's how psychologists are different from intuitive psychologists, in that we actually go out and test these two different hypotheses to see which one is more true, or is true more often, or are there different situations where one is true and the other isn't. We have a lot of these different idioms that put our common sense in conflict with one another. For example, birds of a feather flock together, or opposites attract. Are we attracted to people that are similar to us or dissimilar to us? Again, this is another question that we have as human beings, but psychologists actually study and test. A final one is, when you're working on a project, is it better to have more people or less people? And again, we have two conflicting idioms. Two heads are better than one, or too many chefs spoil a broth. So as you can see, common sense is often contradictory. Well, what about intuition or going with your gut feeling about something? One problem with this approach is that your intuitions about a person or topic may be different from someone else's. For example, you might have the gut feeling that someone is aggressive and unfriendly, but someone else thinks that person is actually friendly. Who's correct? Psychological science allows us to test these things without relying on common sense 
or intuition. Because oftentimes we find that what we assume to be correct or our intuitions about the world are actually incorrect. One thing to be on the lookout for as you learn more about psychological research is the hindsight bias. This is the phenomenon that once people learn about a particular effect or finding, they feel like they knew it all along. You can think of it kind of like the no-duh effect. However, you could present some people with a finding and other people with the opposite finding and then ask them about whether they agree or disagree with the finding. And you'll find that both groups agree with the finding, even though the findings were opposite. So as we progress through this course, be aware that you may feel like saying no duh to some of the findings. However, combining what we know about common sense, intuition, and the hindsight bias, you should recognize that without doing the studies, we really wouldn't know what the right answer is. The remainder of this lecture will cover the seven central themes that underlie the foundations of psychological science. First, we will introduce the scientific method, which dictates how we study psychological phenomena. Second, we will discuss the nature-nurture debate. Third, we will address the mind-body problem. Fourth, we will discuss how advances in biological research are informing our understanding of human psychology. Fifth, we will discuss how our brains have adapted in response to evolutionary pressures, as well as cultural ones. Sixth, we will discuss how psychologists examine phenomenon at different levels of analysis. We will end the discussion of how we are often influenced by things outside of our awareness. Psychology is a science. It uses the same fundamental principles as chemistry and physics. These principles are what differentiate psychology from common sense and intuition. Psychologists seek to answer many of the same questions that lay people and philosophers have asked for centuries. However, we use the scientific method. We'll cover the scientific method in much greater detail in later lectures. One question that is often raised is what is the source of our behaviors and our thoughts? That is, are variations in psychological characteristics biologically innate? Are we born that way? Or are they acquired through education, culture, and experience? Take, for example, intelligence. Are some people just born smarter? Or do they get that way through learning? The answer for intelligence, as with nearly every psychological characteristic, is both. To illustrate this, I want you to think about planting tomatoes. I have some seeds that are genetically engineered to grow very quickly and produce large fruit. That is the nature component. Now I have to choose where to plant them. If I plant them in rich soil and water them, pruning off the non-producing stems, I will likely get very good fruit. However, if I plant them in poor soil and neglect them, they will produce less. If we apply this to intelligence, do you think the next Einstein, if raised in a ne neglectful home, with little access to education, would flourish? Likely not. So both nature and nurture are needed. The good news is that a rich environment full of learning opportunities and love can improve the outcomes of individuals who are born with lower innate intelligence. Studies examining the question of intelligence and nature-nurture have found nearly equal impact from both. One of your videos this week is titled Separated Twins and examines the question of nature versus nurture. Rene Descartes developed the theory of dualism, which proposed that the mind and body are separate but intertwined. Many of the functions previously assigned to the mind, he assigned to the body, such as memory and imagination. That is, that they were reflexes. He concluded that the rational mind was divine and separate from the meat of the body. The mind-body problem has focused on this question of whether the mind is separate and distinct from the body, or if it is a manifestation of the body's experiences. Most psychologists reject the idea of dualism. Instead, they believe that the mind is what the brain does. Recent advances in chemistry, biology, 
anatomy, and neuroscience have improved our understanding of psychology. Mapping the human genome has provided us with the blueprint that is our species. We are on the threshold of great breakthroughs in understanding how we think and why we behave the way we do. Psychology 201 will cover these breakthroughs in much greater detail. One of the most radical and important scientific ideas was Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. In 1859 he published On the Origin of Species, which outlined natural selection, the mechanism by which all creatures on the planet evolved. Natural selection is the process by which advantageous mutations, which occur randomly, lead a creature to be more likely to survive and pass on their genetics. This process, also known as survival of the fittest, means that individual creatures better suited to their environments will survive and reproduce, resulting in offspring which may also have those traits, leading them to also survive and reproduce, with this occurring over and over. The mind was one of these mutations, which made our early ancestors better suited to their environment. So our minds are adaptive in that they evolve to meet certain challenges. Evolutionary psychologists study human psychology with the perspective that certain traits and behaviors are evolved to meet the environmental pressures early in our species development. Certain behaviors and physical mechanisms, which are found universally in all people, have developed to solve adaptive problems. Examples include being able to detect cheaters. The reason for this is that cheaters drain resources from the group, which could lead to the group as a whole dying off. So being able to tell who is not carrying their weight would be adaptive for both group and individual survival. Another example which we will discuss later in the term are certain emotions which are found universally, that is they are found in people across all cultures. Some adaptations we have developed in our early history actually can cause problems in our modern world. For example, we have evolved to seek out and enjoy sweet and fatty foods. This is because our brains run on glucose, and we need fat to line our neurons with a fatty material called the myelin sheath that insulates the axon. This was adaptive in our evolutionary past, since sweet and fatty foods were relatively rare. So eating them when we could was a good thing. However, in our modern world we have access to fat and sweet foods any time, so our preference for them can actually be harmful, leading to issues such as diabetes and obesity. Why would evolution do this? Well, the reason is that natural selection works slowly, and we haven't had the environmental pressures long enough for it to correct. One of the biggest challenges in our lives is how to interact with other humans. We are social creatures that rely on our groups to survive. This is true now and was even more true in our evolutionary past. So while biological evolution is slow, cultural evolution can occur very quickly. Think about your own life and how the world has changed in that time. The rapid increase in our reliance on social media and technology is a cultural adaptation, not a biological one. So while we all start with the basic biological hardware that is developed over millions of years, the impact of culture can result in people from other cultures have vastly different ways of thinking, behaving, beliefs, and values. Cultural psychologists study the ways that culture results in differences as well as the things that are universal in human behavior. Psychologists examine psychological phenomena at four levels of analysis – biological, individual, social, and cultural. What does this mean? Well, think about the following question. How do we react to outgroup members, that is, people who are not members of our group? I will define each level and discuss how they examine this question of how we respond to outgroup members. The biological level studies how the physical body, including the brain, contributes to the mind and behavior. 
For example, neuroscientists have examined the electrical activity that occurs in the brain when people are presented with outgroup versus in-group faces, finding that very quickly, within milliseconds, our brains respond differently to them. The individual level of analysis examines how individual differences in personality and other mental processes influence our thoughts and behavior. For example, people that have had more exposure or positive experience with outgroup members show less of a bias towards in-group versus outgroup members. The social level explores how groups affect how people interact and influence one another. Studies at this level have found that people are more likely to reward members of their in-group than those in the out-group. This is known as in-group bias, as well as seeing in-group members as much more diverse than members of the out-group, who we perceive as very similar to one another. This process is known as out-group homogeneity. We will discuss in-group bias as well as out-group homogeneity in more detail when we get into social psychology. The cultural level of analysis examines the impact of cultural experience on our psychology. For example, Westerners tend to be independent and autonomous, stressing their individuality. Easterners tend to be more interdependent, stressing their sense of being part of a collective. Members of collectivist cultures tend to have a much more strict divide between who they see as their in-group and who they see as their out-group as compared to more independent cultures. The final theme of psychology is that we are often unaware of what is influencing our behavior. As we have already seen, there are many factors that can influence us, including our biology and culture. Many of these factors are difficult to detect. Some of them, like culture, are so ubiquitous that they fade into the background. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Why did you have that? Well, you can probably think of a couple reasons, but some of them are likely not immediately available. Think about the impact of your culture on your choice of breakfast. What about the impact of your early childhood? Maybe your breakfast choice was primed by a commercial you just watched. Human psychology is extremely complex, which is both fascinating and frustrating to study. That is why there are so many subfields within psychology. It allows us to examine these complex questions in different ways. Humans have always been intrigued by our own and other people's thoughts and behaviors. Psychology as a field has given us the tools and the methods to start answering these questions.